Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm Jean Shafiroff, your host. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, Bill Boggs. Bill is best known as the Emmy winning TV personality and author. Let's all welcome Bill Boggs. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. It's, it's good to see you again, lovely Jane. Normally, I just see you on the Instagram post floating somewhere in a beautiful gown. You must spend a lot of time at Target, you know, picking these things out. <laughs> well, actually, uh, the gowns are one aspect of what I do, but I serve on eight charity boards. I host this TV I know. show, and, and I've written a book myself. But, Bill, we want to talk about you. This interview is about you and what Thank you've you. done. Thank you. For years and years... You were a TV host on almost all the major networks. You've dealt with just about every single celebrity. Now, this show is about philanthropy. Can you tell us, in your opinion, who is the most generous celebrity? Well, one could say that Jerry Lewis raised a huge amount of money with the telethons, which no longer exist. So he was generous with his time, which I've always been. But based based on my knowledge, I would say that people who really know him I would say that Frank Sinatra is probably the one, the most philanthropic and generous uh, personality whom I've known personally would be Frank Sinatra. Very interesting. And now you yourself, you have hosted literally hundreds and hundreds of charity events. You've also emceed them. What did you learn? And from that experience, what can you impart on our audience today? Well, um, there's three questions there. Uh, one of the things I learned was that, mo that in New York, most of them went on too long. Many of the people had to take trains back to Greenwich, you know, and there would be a certain time limit when the thing should be over. And I could see itchy people, people getting angry that they were there, they contributed all this money, they sort of like became like the emperor's clothes. So when I um, set out to produce a couple of events like this, one of the things I really made sure, Gene, was that it would end with enough time to make a certain Greenwich, Connecticut train. And, um, I, I produced three or four events. Only one missed the time thing. This was um, at the Carlisle Hotel, and it was for, um, I believe it was the, the Pediatric Pavilion of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I had, uh, I got three uh, guests to perform. Shelley Bruce, who was in Annie, and Marvin Hamlish, who was a great friend of mine, and just uh, someone I, I miss to this day and Robert Klein. So the setup was going to be, first was going to be Robert Klein. And I said, look, we have an hour. Each of you will do 20 minutes. So I had it all timed out. If they do 25, we're going to be okay. So the other events that worked, when I told the talent, 20 minutes, there you go. So this event, Robert Klein comes out and he's being expansive and he's talking and he's funny and 20 minutes go by, 25 minutes go by, he has 40 minutes. And then, and then Marvin comes up to me and says, Bill, you know, I love you, but if he did 40, I have to do 40. No, no, I have to. I just can't do 20 after he did 40. So Marvin does 40. He's already in 80. Poor little Shelly Bruce from Annie comes out and says, just sing tomorrow and get off the stage. So that, but that's one of the things I learned. And that's sort of like an insider thing. You have to and be on stage and sense what was is going on in the room to understand that something is going on too long. And I always thought, if they're putting up all this money, they should go home happy, not annoyed, you know. And I agree with that. I think the shorter the speeches at a charity event, the better. And what? what about some funny behind the scenes situations that you've experienced with different celebrities while you were doing these charity events? Well, I, I, did, I, I produced a charity event mm -hmm. at, the, at the Rainbow Room in New York City, and this was for scleroderma. Uh, when Richard Baker, my partner in Box Baker Productions, and I were doing uh, 
music shows and, and, and comedy shows, we were working with a company and the president of the company, a man named Siegel's wife, excuse me, his mother-in-law had scleroderma, just a terrible degenerative skin disease. And so uh, we, Richard and I set out, you know, to produce a, a, a charity event to raise some money. And that was a really a notable event. It was at the Rainbow Room. And it was a way, it was before Twyla Tharp created her ballets to Sinatra music. And I'd always had the idea that it would be interesting to do a ballet, a ballet to a Sinatra song. And I particularly liked the song Violets for Your Furs. That was just this idea. So a friend of mine who was a principal dancer at the time in the New York City Ballet, uh, still a friend of the state, Chris Fleming, uh, who also did some choreography, chore choreographed a ballet that only was performed one time to Violets for Your Furs, which was done with a prima ballerina from the New York ba City Ballet, uh, right in the, in one of the, the dance floor in the Rainbow Room. And that really went over. And I was so happy when I saw, you know, several years later that the Twyla Tharp was seizing upon the visualness of of, of lyrical music, well, not just Sinatra songs, but lyrical music. And the other thing that happened that night, is I, I, I never forgot this. I had Subi Sales on, who yeah. was going to, you know, comedian Subi Sales, television personality. And for whatever reason, he didn't like my introduction. Like I didn't say enough about him. A little bit of ego in there. And he came out, he was angry. You know, an angry comedian on on set. So that's a little behind the scenes there from my standpoint as, as a producer. Yeah. So what did you learn from that? <laughs> what did I learn? Don't piss off soupy sales. That's what I learned. <laughs> I, actually, to this day, I would say if I'm introducing somebody, Gene, uh, you know, a personality, I want to make, I like to say to them, I'm going to read your introduction to you. I think any, by the way, that's actually a good rule for anyone getting up speaking. You're speaking, you're going to MC something. That person over there is going to introduce you. Have them just say, read, would you read your introduction of me to you? That way, like, they're not introducing the wrong person, which I have done every now and then. You know, give me, oh, no, that's not, not you. What, where? Ah. Anyway, that's what I learned. Oh, and that's very good advice, because I think when you're speaking about another human being, you have to be very, very careful about what you say and how you say it. And I'm sure your intentions were good, but Sippy Sales didn't think it was enough. But anyway, you've introduced countless people, hundreds and hundreds. And when all but one is not satisfied, well, you know you're doing something right. Well, I now, think so. Go yes. Um, Bill Boggs, you're down in Palm Beach right now. I'm yes. in the Palm Beach area as well. And we have so many different charity events here in Palm Beach. I've been going to many. And of course, up in New York, we both go to many. You've been going to many down here. What's right. the difference between the events here in Palm Beach and those in New York? The difference between balls and charitable events between here and New York, it, it's easier to get to them here. You know, you sit in your car and drive in New York, it's a stormy night, you'll have a difficult time. I don't, I don't feel that there is really, I, I think the people more relaxed, in general, the people in Palm Beach are more relaxed on a day-to-day -day basis because they're in Palm Beach, Florida than the people in Manhattan are just because they're living, you know, in a big, frantic, impatient city, which we love, but that's what New York is, a big, frantic, impatient city. Um, so I think the vibe is a little, I say, more genteel here. I think the men are far better dressed in Palm Beach than in New York City. I know New York men will come after me for that, but I, it's just a matter of fact. I see, I think the best dressed men in general, it's a generalization. But on the level that we're talking about, about philanthropy and balls and really nice restaurants and things like that, um, parties and parties in one's home, by far, the men here are, are better dressed than, and certainly better dressed than L.A., where, you know, 
In LA, a guy's idea of getting dressed up as Hawaiian shirt with the palm trees on it and a pair of khakis. Meanwhile, his wife's wearing Valentino, but somehow he thinks that matches. But anyway, there are a couple of, uh, but in, in terms of how they're produced, I don't think there's much difference. Um, maybe bigger name talent performing here, actually performing. I know Paul Anka was here within the last six months. Um, I think Diana Ross was performing down here. But that would be basically it. Interesting. I've gone to many events down here, and they sell out quickly. What I've noticed is that many, many people here in uh, uh, Palm Beach really want to go out to these charity events. Yeah. And maybe because it's post-COVID, people are signing up earlier. They just want to get out, period. They want to have some fun. And they're willing to write some very big checks, which I think is absolutely oh. important. For a couple things there, the, to continue with, with your original question there. The um, energy, the energy behind charitable, char big and small charitable events here in Palm Beach is greater, in my opinion, than the energy behind them in New York. Here they become more a full, fulsome part of one's social life. Whereas in New York, they can be an element of a very busy life that's a professional life. The people here are somewhat older. They're not necessarily working every day as many of the people behind uh, similar events in, in New York would be. Yes, well, people, once they retire, they have more time for philanthropy. And as you said, people really want to go out. I have found that Palm Beach is an extremely social place. Oh my word. I, that's why I want to bring, I want to bring my beloved girlfriend, Jane Rothschild on in a minute, because um, that's one of the things we've both experienced. I mean, we both have lived really full and are living full and really busy lives, but I don't think we've ever been in a situation where things are happening and there's so much to do. We have to look at our calendar and say, and this is a blessing. This is not a complaint. No, we better leave that night open for some rest. Sure enough, then what happens on that night? Bingo. Well, we better go. That'll be fun. So, yeah. And, you know, another thing, the Monday section of the Palm Beach Post, which is a very good newspaper. They have, they have great reporting themselves and Gannett and USA Today and the New York Times and so forth. The Monday section has a full section on philanthropy with pictures of people in the paper, uh, money that's been raised here or there. And the, so the sort of things we're talking about are really reported here, much more so than just maybe a couple of pictures in the New York Times, if you're lucky, in the style section. Yes, well, I think philanthropy is very mar much a part of the social fabric of- Yeah, it, it really is. More so, more so than New York, in a way you've answered your own question, much more part of the social fabric than New York. Let me bring on Jane. Jane, come on out here for a second. Jane, has, you, you, you remember, Jim, remember Jane? Here I come. Yes, yes, so, our audience. You know Hi, Jane. There's. Hi, Jane. But for our audience, we are with Bill Boggs. He is an Emmy award-winning TV personality and author. He's just brought on his significant other Jane Rothschild, and we're going to talk to both of them about philanthropy in the Palm Beach area and also their lives. And I want to hear about your book too, Bill. Well, let me just say, start with Jane. Yeah, the book, of course, otherwise, if you want to know about the book, this is what ends up. See, it's like that. There's the book. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. There's Jane. I just want to say one thing. I too have won two Emmys. That's Even right. Just saying, that's Emmy Award winning Jane Rothschild. That's right. For congratulations. That was and and 80 for producing the $20,000 pyramid. It's a long time ago, but. Well, well that's wonderful. It. And congratulations. And maybe we can hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But uh, Jane, what's your take on the philanthropy in Palm Beach? It's keeping me very busy, and I'm shopping a lot because I have to look good. <laughs> I ran into you just last week at a breast cancer fundraiser at the Colony, which was very interesting. Um, and it was it, it, it was tabletops, which I think wouldn't happen in New York so much. What do you mean by tabletops? Just explain what that Different is. table decorated. How do, that that fundraiser was like about twenty tables decorated by various designers. 
with, with different themes. And you would buy things off no, of No, you didn't buy. You just, it was just interesting to see. Oh, I see. Um, and that was a wonderful fundraiser. Yes, it was. And uh, just to give you a little history on that, because I've been involved as honorary chair of their events in New York City and the Hamptons for the last two or three years, uh, the event raises money for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And this year, they decided to come uh, to the colony in Palm Beach. They had a very successful event. Uh, women were and men were there to see the beautiful uh, tabletops. Um, the name of the organization is Hol Holiday House. And really, their primary uh, function is uh, to raise money for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. But getting back to some of the other events, I know certain events that I wanted to go to, I was closed out of and I couldn't go. So I know for next year, I've got to sign up very, very early. And right now with different addresses in different cities, well, the invitation might be coming up somewhere in New York, but I'm sure that it's happens. very yeah. complicated. And I'm now starting to give everyone my email address as the best way to connect with me. I agree. I agree too. If one of the one in general, one of the things we support because of our mutual passion for it is music. Uh, Jane contributes to the, the Palm Beach Chamber Music Society. I'm involved, as is Jane, in uh, supporting Legends Radio, which is a wonderful a radio station that uh, essentially plays what's called the Great American Songbook uh, for the most part. We'll be going to a, one of their gala again this year. And um, we go into the, the uh, Palm Beach Opera Gala next week. Right. So, uh, opera. So, so support of the and arts. Thanks to me. Support of the arts. Is, we need, is, in my opinion, it should be more government support of the arts, but short of another 20 or 30 percent of that, uh, uh, we need to contribute and support the arts that, that we enjoy and we believe in. And Kravis Center is remarkable. This sounds like one of those PBS plays. <laughs> well, I agree. You know, I actually, I think I'm, I'm seeing my accountant on Friday. So I've made a list of all the donations I've made this past year. You have another, you have another 25 minutes to read the list. So, so just, it, just hit some of the high points. Wait, wait, it's a whole page. It's a whole page. That's why I wanted Jane to come out. But, my list is shorter. She has a whole page. But these are local. I mean, so it, it, it covers the Cultural Council of Palm Beach, the, the Tri County Animal Rescue, um, Oof. Morse Life, FAU, the university. FAU, yeah. Well, Planned Parenthood, Dress for Success. That's a good one. Dress for Success. It's extremely good. I've helped that one too. Yeah, the Drama Works Theater, the Wick Theater, Norton Museum. Yes, and a lot of these charity groups, um, I've already been to their events for the Norton, for the Palm Beach Symphony, for the Palm Beach Opera. Perhaps they're having a few events uh, this year, and I think that's great. Now, a lot of groups also come to Palm Beach to do charity galas because they know that many people are transplanted here from New York, from the Midwest, really from all over the world. And people come here because it's probably one of the most beautiful spots on the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. And, yes. And they know that people here open up their hearts and they also open up their wallets to philanthropy, which I think is so extraordinary and so important. I wrote a book on philanthropy that I just want to mention for one minute. It's called Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. I published that in 2016, and I have a small section on philanthropy in Palm Beach. And what I said in that chapter was that to be social in Palm Beach, you have to be philanthropic because it's so much part of the culture of Palm Beach. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. People come here because they've been successful. They want to live in the sun. They want to have a good life. Most of the people that I met are kind. They're generous. They're well-mannered. I mean, it's a great place. It's a beautiful place. And it's nice to see such generosity towards philanthropy. And I'm sure you're going to agree with that. One hundred percent. I do have one question for you. You know, being a talk show host, I have to ask a question. What initially, all the way back, initially lit the spark in Eugene 
that led to your really dedicating so much of your life to philanthropy? I think that's a great question. The first thing was how I was raised. I went to 12 years of Catholic school where the nuns talked all about the importance of giving back. And we actually were involved as young children in the giving back pro process. We had bake sales. We had, I don't know, we were selling Girl Scout cookies. We were doing everything to raise money. My dad was a school teacher. He actually was a music teacher and he loved his students. It was very important to him that they learned. The family was very much a focus uh, for my parents. And then my first career was as a physical therapist. And I worked in an inner city hospital around Col Columbia University where I had gone to school and where I had graduated. And I saw real hardship there. And then through my travels to countries like Cambodia, different parts of Latin America, South America, all of this left an indelible impression on me. And when my life changed, I went out, I got an MBA from Columbia, I worked on Wall Street. And um, later on, when I was raising my daughters, I realized I had to do something and I wanted to do whatever I could to get involved in the philanthropic process because I felt very blessed. That's, that's my so, story. What about your story? <laughs> well, I, I, first of all, I'm really glad I asked that question because although we have seen each other in passing socially, and always have a pleasant, you know, engagement. Particularly, I like seeing you at the animal event uh, out out in Southampton. And you interviewed us before. I really don't didn't know the answer to that question or, or or much about your background. I think that what got me involved was essentially <clears throat> donate when I came to New York. Right, I did a little before I came to New York. I had my show in North Carolina, uh, although I'm from Philadelphia. But anyway, I. Being on television, I was sought after to MC things. You know, I have a television show every day. So by the fact you have a known person as the MC, it helps with ticket sales, allegedly. And I would do anything that someone asked me. I, I mean, in terms of MCing a show. Not, there are other things I wouldn't do. Many. But anyway, um, that's how I got involved. I got involved by volunteering my time. You know, what the, and I wasn't making millions of dollars on television, but I always felt that if I, if, if I answer yes, I'll be there, that I was contributing. And that's how I got involved, Jane. And so important. And I want to thank you, uh, Bill Boggs, for all you've done. And also Jane Rothschild. The two of you are fantastic. Now, this show, Successful Philanthropy, airs in the Hamptons. And I want to say uh, to the Hamptons community that you are all very, very generous. New York City too, just about everywhere in the United States. And so thank you. And because we're focusing a little bit today on philanthropy in Palm Beach, it doesn't mean that the Hamptons isn't very generous. And many of the charities come out to the Hamptons to do their events because again, people are generous and they wanna give and they wanna support also New York City. Now, Bill, you've written a book. We've written many books. Um, the most recent yeah. one is a book about a real life dog. His name is uh, Spike, I think. No. That's the name of the book. It's, it's a novel. It's, a no it's not a memoir. It's not a biography. It's a, it's a sat satirical novel. It's satire. It's called The Avengers of Spike the Wonder Dog, as told to Bill Boggs. All right, bye-bye, Jane. And the thing I wanted to tell you about this on the back is published by Post Hill Press. A portion of the proceeds from the sale of the book will be donated to animal rescue charities. So that anyone who buys The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, it's available on Amazon. You just type in Bill Boggs' book. This is one that, and the sequel, Gene, is coming out in July. The follow up, which follows this directly, and what we're trying to do is to take all 600 pages from both books and sell it as a comedy property for a strip cartoon series. If we hit that pay dirt, a portion of the proceeds from that will be donated to animal rescue organizations. That's part of the soul of this book because part of the story of the adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog involves the dog being uh, 
abducted, right? Which happens, you know, people steal dogs off the street and stuff like that all the time. Uh, but the main thing I want with my goal with this book is to make people laugh. That's it. And the reviews and, have been good. So thank you. And then I guess it helps bring more of visibility to animals and the importance they play in our lives, especially our pets, our dogs and our cats, but also um, me, I'm an animal lover and I I'm, I I'm involved with a number of charities and um, farm animals, all animals are important to me, how we treat them, because animals don't have a voice of their own and it's up to us to provide for them. And there are many groups of people that, you know, and animals that we need to help and the environment. And uh, so for our viewers, if you're thinking about getting involved in philanthropy and you're not involved, well, find something that really interests you and get involved in trying to help go out there and volunteer learn all about an organization, learn as much as you can. And then of course, if you have uh, the resources, well, I think you have an obligation to give. Uh, Bill Boggs, you are a great um, guest. Oh, and it's so good to see you, Gene. You know, one of the things I wanna say at the very end is hunger is a great source, a great place to make your donations. Hunger in America. During the nine years I was on the Food Network, we did a lot of charity shows for Meals on Wheels and things like that. All very important. And um, for yeah. most of us, we know that during the pandemic, uh, food lines across the United States were wrapping around buildings. And so hunger remains a problem. And one of the, the great charities, Feeding America, uh, City Meals on Wheels, so great. many charities <clears throat> that deal with hunger. Bill, one more question. Yes. You wrote a book back in the 90s about what it takes to be a successful person. What yeah, does I, it take to be a successful person? Well, that's a big, I, I've done hour long interviews on that. The book was about my interviewing highly successful people like Richard Branson, Diane von Furstenberg, about the internal qualities that led to their success, not business strategies, personal behavior qualities. And if I had to sum it, I think that latching on to your passion and following your passion, even though at the beginning you might not know where it's going to lead you, follow your passion and the money will come. And the satisfaction will be there immediately if you're following your passion. And I love what you've said. Bill Boggs, you've been a wonderful guest. Bill Boggs today, he's a TV personality. He's an author and philanthropist. Thank you very much. Thank you all for watching Successful Philanthropy. I'm Jean Schaffer, your host. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Jean.